Just ahead on American Black Journal, an organization for African-American lawyers celebrates its 100th anniversary. Plus, the Carr Center launches a new year of African-American cultural programs and a new report on the impact of art here in Michigan. That's all coming up right now on American Black Journal. Masco Corporation is proud to manufacture innovative and environmentally friendly products for the home. Delta faucets, craft made in Marillat cabinets, and Bear Brand paints have all been designed with you in mind. Masco and its family of companies, serving Michigan communities since 1929. How does diversity bring energy to us all? At DTE Energy, we believe that it's the contributions of all that build great communities. As a company, we grow stronger by welcoming the unique perspectives of everyone. As community members, we support our state's broad culture and heritage. From working closely with women and minority-owned suppliers to embracing our local cultures, DTE Energy is powering diversity. The DTE Energy Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public Television. For nearly 100 years, Ally has been a part of Detroit, and we give back by volunteering and donating in our community. We have a commitment to diversity and increasing economic mobility in our hometown. At Ally, we're dedicated to doing it right every single day. Welcome to American Black Journal. I'm Stephen Henderson. As we start Black History Month, we're shining the spotlight on an organization that's celebrating 100 years of service. The Wolverine Bar Association's roots date back to 1919, when African-American attorneys in Detroit formed their own law club after being denied membership in white bar associations. The organization helps minority law students through its programs and community service projects. Joining me now is the president of the Wolverine Bar Association, Jerome Crawford. Welcome to American Black Journal. <laughs> well, thanks so much, Stephen. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Absolutely. So 100 years. Take us back to 1919. What was going on? Well, it seems like uh, yesterday. Uh, um, right? So, you were there, of <laughs> absolutely, course. we know we both were. <laughs> um, so, 1919, our roots trace back to an organization, uh, as you noted here, uh, called the Harlan Club. And in that time, because of you know denials of you know those who were interested in the law or actually black attorneys, we formed our own bar association. Uh, in the 1930s, we changed our name to the Wolverine Bar Association. Have been in the Metro Detroit community, but the really state of Michigan at large, doing all types of work to support the community as well as our you know law. Constituency. Yeah. So talk about what bar associations do. I think people who aren't lawyers yeah. don't necessarily know. That. Yeah. You know, most people that hear like you're going to a bar association, they assume it's a bar. <laughs> the uh, bar so I like you spend a lot of time at the bar. <laughs> um, so really, bar association. The way they're formed is, uh, you know, imagine moving around maybe college campuses or even high school, so different clubs and, and, and groups people to belong to. Now, the one requirement generally is that you either are a lawyer or, in some respects, maybe a law student or interested student. in the law. Yeah. Um, so the purpose is for definitely uh, community collaboration. So within that same legal community, and then those bar associations may be affinity bar based, for instance, which means we all come from a similar background. In this context, we're all minority lawyers, uh, namely for the most part African American lawyers and law students as well as judges. Yeah. And what kind of activities do you provide for lawyers? Oh, so for lawyers, uh, we do we do a number of things. Um, we uh, again are very involved for. Uh, our summer clerkship program. And what that is is it's a placement program to be able to put law students, namely African American minority yeah. law students who into, don't get as many opportunities. Who don't get as many opportunities yeah. to get them into say large law firms as well as into the court system by allowing them to clerk with federal judges. Um, we also do some programming um, on a monthly basis for our members, which allows them to target certain key areas. We just did one last night uh, called financial planning for solo practitioners. So we've tried to target different segments within our bar association um, to really provide programs of value. Yeah. Uh, and the barrister's ball <laughs> It's one of the big events that you guys have that uh, that maybe people have heard of before. People may have heard of it. Um, in fact, the Barristers Ball is um, it's our largest fundraiser of the year, mm -hmm. uh, and we have a gathering of approximately 1,500 uh, folks from the legal, business, uh, civic, uh, political community that all come together really just to celebrate the best of, for Southeast Southeast Michigan. Um, this event is a fundraiser again. It's geared toward our scholarships. So we have a scholarship program that we actually provide law students uh, with scholarships on an annual basis. It 
also goes to fund some of our other key program the, that the Wolverine Bar Foundation does, our charitable arm, such as our pipeline program. Pipeline is something we're really excited about. This is where we actually get involved in students' uh, age, students' lives um, when they're in high school. Mm -hmm. So we have one called Pretty Brown Girl. We've been working with Mumford High School for the last few years doing that. And a new exciting program we just started this year called Mighty Young Men. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Mighty Young Men program, uh, done with a group called SDM2, right in the Detroit community, is fantastic, allowing us to really get lawyers, you know, even black lawyers, involved in the lives of these young people. Yeah. Uh, uh, 1919, uh, I would imagine, all of the things that that that, uh, that stood in black people's way uh, in history were were pretty much in place at that at that point. <laughs> sure. uh, you know, save for slavery itself, uh, it was still not a not a, a time of opportunity. Today it is, but but we still see some of these barriers, I guess, uh, that exist, and we see fewer. Uh, African American kids getting opportunities uh, than probably should. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Stephen. I wish we could say that the issues have been solved by the work of <clears throat> organizations like the Wolverine Bar and, and many others that over years, over the years, we've definitely made progress. Right? There's definitely been some, you know, ascension, if you will. Mm -hmm. But you know, if you look at say the quote unquote big law firms, or you look at the court system and who are the judges that people come before every single day, it's not reflective of the community. Um, we're making progress, um, but we need to do more. To that end, pretty interesting story that people may have heard. You know, Jay Z just had a lawsuit where he actually was able to win trademark panel, mm -hmm. and he said the entire panel of all those that were listed um, on the arbitration panel for complex cases, not a single black attorney, and yeah. the American Arbitration Association, and he was able to win to then have different arbitrators appointed. And he said, look, there's there's no way I can get a you know a fair judgment call on my matter without somebody that's that's looking like me on that panel. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you seem like a fairly young man to be the president. <laughs> Tell us a little about uh, your background and what led you to law. Well, well you know, well, thank you. Um, it's, it's a youthful face. I try to do my best. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so what led me to the law, uh, and I was actually reflecting on this the other day, it was really a mere 10 years ago or so. Mm -hmm that I was sitting in the shoes of many of our law students that are applying for what's called our summer clerkship program today. And here I am, having been a beneficiary of that summer clerkship program, you know, going through the judicial externship program, having worked in a big law firm, being in-house counsel now, and, and I've always found a sense of obligation to pay it forward and believing that to whom much is given, much is required. So yeah. with those blessings, I've done it, you know, to really just serve. Um, so what got me interested in the law has always been the, the concept of service. So I'm an attorney by day, but I'm an actor by night, an actor and a comedian. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, I found this sort of merging toward the law and the concept of justice. And I've been able to really sort of mirror and pair those tools uh, together. Uh, and then here I am now, you know, being the president, it's really a humbling experience. Uh, so much so that I made our theme for the year, servant leadership. Um, because I wanted to get back to the roots of what it means to actually lead is to really serve others. And we yeah. built that on four quick pillars, um, which you said, be nice. So to be noble, be innovative, be collaborative, and be empowering. Huh. Wow. That's pretty. That's a that's a pretty amazing uh, acronym there. Uh, what when you talk with young people uh, in in Michigan and about the idea of being lawyers, what do they tell you about their sense of opportunity and their sense of the obligation to have service be part of what they do? Sure. So <clears throat> say young people, and and if and if I may even narrow it to say you know young minority students, right? Mm -hmm. They say I don't see anybody that looks like me. For the most part, I mean, even I still say that myself. I mean, I'm a, I'm a, I'm born and raised in the city of Detroit, you know, the West Side, Seven Mile and Lodge, where yeah. I grew up, right? Yeah. And I'm still the first attorney in my family I can I can point to, first one to go to law school. So most of us don't have a benchmark, hmm. right? We don't have anyone to kind of compare ourselves against. We don't have anybody to call and say, "Hey, how do I study for these exams?" So many of us are pioneers in our own right. So the encouragement I often give to students is to find mentors. You know, find those that are going to be, you know, have done it before and don't reinvent the wheel to work smarter, not harder. But I also implore them with a principle I live my own life by, and that is to lift as you climb. Hmm. So as you are having doors pull open up for you, pull you, right? somebody behind you. Yeah. You know, make sure, as uh, Judge Damon J. Keith often says, that we're walking on floors we did not scrub, right? right? And walking through <laughs> right. doors we didn't open. Right. So as you go, you scrub floors and you open doors. Yeah. Well, congratulations on 100 years. And, Thank you. Uh, we'll look forward to this spring's Barrister's Ball. Yeah, and one note, I just said Barrister's Ball is going to be on April 6th mm -hmm. at the Detroit Marriott Renaissance Center. Go to www.wolverinebar.org, all the information you need. we got some pretty exciting surprises and only one time to celebrate the 100 oh, years. There you go. Also, our theme is the Oscars this year. Oh, so really? Red yeah. Carpet Affair. There you go. <laughs> Excellent. All right, well, thanks very much for being here. Thank you for having me.
Just ahead, the power of African-American arts and culture. But first, we continue our look back at this program over the last 50 years. Here's a 1998 Detroit Black Journal conversation with Wayne County Assistant Prosecutor at the time, Kim Worthy, about the infamous Malice Green case. A lot of things have been said about your style. I've mm -hmm. heard everything from uh, very intense. Some people said a legal pit bull. How would you describe <laughs> your? <laughs> how would you describe your style? Um, it's interesting. I think I don't think I was any more or less aggressive than any of the male attorneys that were practicing in that same case. And I think they're saying that about me. And I think mainly because I'm a woman, and I don't have any problem with that. I can't imagine prosecuting a homicide case when someone has lost a loved one and when you have repercussions like we have for this trial and being anything but aggressive and competent. I've always been very confident about my abilities and um, I know that I am competent so I just act accordingly. And I think that uh, you have to be aggressive, you have to be in, you know, insightful, you have to be intense sometimes. Well, in fact um, we have a little bit of you in the courtroom. Let's take a look now at uh, Kim Worthy in action. You were more concerned with getting your cigarettes, your lighter, and the ID card, and the narcotics than you were than someone possibly killing your client, weren't you? Your partner, weren't you? What do you want me to answer? I'm telling you what I saw. That isn't what I asked you, because you've already clearly established you didn't see a thing. You didn't hear nothing, you didn't see nothing, you didn't do nothing. Well, Your Honor, she's arguing with the witness at this point, and I would object to this line of questions. Well, there we have it. Uh, you seem to be giving it to uh, Mr. Butson pretty, pretty strongly there on, on the stand. Is that your intent to, uh, I won't say intimidate the person on the stand, but certainly uh, cut it to the chase, put some pressure on them? Well, it's not, yeah, it's not intimidation, it's cross-examination. And I thought his, his story was, high, and I call it a story deliberately, was highly incredible. And I wanted the jurors to be able to decipher that information for themselves. And there were questions that I think that everybody had, and I just asked them. I asked the questions that I thought they may have been wondering about as they listened to his testimony. And to me, it made absolutely no sense. And so I wanted, I wanted him to tell me how it was that this could have happened the way he said it could. And I just didn't see how it could. The Car Center in Detroit is known for inspiring, educating, and entertaining audiences with its African and African American cultural arts programming. It also provides an outlet for artists to create and present their work. Here to tell us more about what's in store this season is Oliver Ragsdale Jr. He is the president of the Car Center. Thanks for being here. Glad to be it's here. It's good to see you. It's good to be back. Yeah. It's been a minute. It has. Yeah. Uh, so tell us, what is going on? At the Car Center. The Car Center's all ahead live, all ahead live. We have a, a great season um, coming up, the winter spring season. Uh, we have Dee uh, Dee Bridgewater and Terry Lynn Carrington, our co artistic directors, who replaced Jerry Allen, who was on this show the right. last time sure. I was here, um, as the co artistic directors. And they're doing a tremendous show together on April the 13th about legends uh, with a tribute to Joni Mitchell and Tina. Turner and the great Nancy Wilson. Um, in a couple of weeks on February 23rd, Savion Glover is going to be here. Wow. He's our artist in residence this year, um, and he's doing two days of workshops for students and professionals, and then a performance at the Detroit School of the Arts on February 23rd um, that is going to highlight, uh, we're calling it a percussion conversation. Dee Dee is going to scat. Terry Lynn is going to play the drums. Savion is going to dance his little toes off. Um, it's just going to be an incredible yeah, night. That and there's amazing. more. Yeah, right. <laughs> there's always more. Always more. Uh, you guys are in a new spot, too. Uh, you were uh, in the middle of downtown Detroit, just south of Grand Circus Park on right. Woodward uh, for a bit, which I loved uh, when I lived downtown. And I could sort of walk by and see all the, the really great art you guys have through the the windows. It was uh, a great, great space. But and, you've uh, just moved up the street. Really. We've moved up the street. We're at the University of Michigan um, Detroit Center where we're doing our gallery work. We have a great exhibition on African Lapa there now. Um, we are doing our programming, as I said, our performing arts programming and educational programming is happening at the Detroit School of the Arts. So we're really excited. And there'll be an announcement in the coming weeks about a new permanent gallery space. Huh. Uh, we're staying in constant 
concentrating our efforts in the Midtown um, area. We've had a great relationship over the years with Midtown and Sue Mosey and the folks there. Mm -hmm. um, our admin offices are in ha at, in the Hannon House Center, so everything will be nice and concentrated. It's right, uh, it's right there. Uh, one of the things I don't think people really get about the Car Center is, uh, and this is one of the things I really like about it, it's the the participatory nature of it, right? You don't just go and look at things or you don't just go see a performance. There's really an opportunity to get involved in creating your own art. As yeah, well. and I mean, it's a couple of different things. Um, you know, African Americans are participatory people. Mm -hmm. So what we like to say is we present African American content tent in African-American context. Mm -hmm. So it's not unusual to be at a concert and hear that applause or hear somebody call out um, or hear people sing the, sing the songs and say, that's my song, <laughs> that's my tune. You know, those, those types of things. Um, and we have, we have great opportunities uh, for young people um, to train. Debbie Allen will be back again this summer with the uh, dance intensive and mm -hmm. those auditions are gonna be on March the 23rd. But we're also adding a musical theater component this she's going to be leading uh, and that audition is uh, March the 24th and then this summer we'll have two weeks of intensive area uh, we're going to be announcing something about film and mm -hmm. education with film uh, with a new LA school that we're uh, affiliating and partnering with so there's lots of ways that um, artists can play they can uh, display their art um, they can come and people can come and sit in the audience and just have a good old time yeah yeah so so put uh, put the the artist and art scene in the city right now in some context uh, it seems to me like things are getting better there's more support for the arts mm -hmm. than there used to be uh, there are more opportunities uh, for people to participate in the arts, but but I wonder how that looks from your chair. Well, I think that um, we we have good great days, mm -hmm. and you, you always have challenges. Yeah, right. um, there are challenges uh, in fundraising, so uh, we're welcome. We welcome the donations. <laughs> uh, we welcome the ticket buyers. We welcome the people who want to participate with tuition and have have their kids uh, involved. Uh, we see the donor pool um, changing and mm -hmm. uh, and growing um, as audiences grow. Um, the car center is. Full focused on uh, not just having um, African Americans experience uh, the African American culture, but we want the greater world to experience and, and know the African American culture. As a matter of fact, we're going to do a broadcast from Detroit to Russia uh, mm -hmm. in March. Um, and they are going to broadcast uh, back to us. We have a new uh, uh, partnership that's developed with one of the regions in, in Russia mm -hmm. that will have a number of things happening in the next couple of years. So a lot of wow. broad things. You have to think about the world and taking Detroit to the world, and that's one of the things we're really interested huh, in. Huh. Uh, uh, talk a little more about the partnership with uh, Detroit School for the Arts, which is another wonderful gem right uh, here it's an, in the city It's of an incredible, incredible gem. Um, uh, we began the relationship last uh, summer when Debbie Allen was here, and we've been able to extend it. In in some ways, the Car Center um, has adopted uh, the, the DSA, and um, whenever artists come to town, they're doing workshops and sessions uh, with the uh, artists, um, and we have an internship program where um, students at DSA are paired with the visiting artists to really get to see uh, the behind the scenes. Um, and they they put this great program together called the Ambassadors, and they're the host um, in the building. And so they've been sort of um, uh, ushers, if you will, oh, and greeters, cool. and very excited um, about being around, around those folks. There's great leadership at the school yeah. and a lot of excitement about what's happening. So we're delighted to be there. Well, and that's, uh, it's also important, given the, the turn back in the school, to the idea of the arts. I mean, uh, the new superintendent has said, we got to have this in every school. Uh, we can't we can't short our kids yeah, uh, and, that opportunity. You know, those of us who have who have been um, artists, I, I figured out, um, I've been doing this, I've been a, a musician for like uh, 55 years, right? 55 <laughs> years, and, and I've been an arts administrator. I spoke at a conference last week, 42 years wow. that, I've, that I've been doing this stuff. And so these young people, um, 
are just, we're in generations that haven't had those kind of experiences mm -hmm. that, that we've had. And so um, the Car Center is really um, dedicated to making sure that those kinds of experiences exist and that they're world-class experiences. We have world-class artists who already live and work here in Detroit. And then this whole other set of people, the Dee Dee Bridgewater and, and NEA uh, and a, um, National Endowment for the Arts Jazz Master, mm -hmm. um, Terry Lynn Carrington, three Grammy awards um, and up for another one this year. Debbie Allen has 10 People's Choice Awards, uh, 10 <laughs> times she choreographed the Academy Awards. All of those people are working here. And we have another one, Carrie Mae Weems. Uh, Carrie Mae, right. who's who's uh, getting, who is our resident artist in visual arts this year and has put together um, an incredible uh, program with 10 young uh, scholars uh, between 22 and 30 and 32 years old yeah. uh, in the visual arts who are from all over the country who applied to come and be a part of the Detroit wow. art scene. Wow. So that's happening. And we have a jazz band that does the same thing that Jerry created before she passed called the Gathering Orchestra. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, all levels, all ages, all people. Yeah, yeah. and it's for all of us here all in the people. city of Detroit. All people. Yeah. All right, Oliver. Wonderful to catch up with you. Thank you. Congrats on the Thank you. Award. Thank you. Check yeah. us out at thecarcenter.org. Yeah, all right. Uh, and finally today... Michigan organization named Creative Many has come out with a report on how the arts impact residents and the economy. It's called the Creative State Michigan Report, and it shows how arts and cultural nonprofits are making a difference in our communities. Detroit Performs has the story. Humans are innately creative, and the arts express our humanity. Engaging in art can foster a sense of identity and belonging. The arts are an opportunity to know other people better. If we don't have arts, we don't really have a soul. So they're just absolutely vital to our community. The arts has helped with the resurgence of Detroit. It's changed the perception of Detroit. Artists are powerful civic, social, and economic forces in Michigan communities. They expand what's possible by engaging others to explore ideas, to resolve community issues, and transform places through creativity. The arts and the creative industries are 4.2% of GDP, which is more than agriculture, more than transportation, more than construction. The arts and you know, creative expression have been a key and core part of the development of the city, of the reputation of the city. You walk the streets of Detroit and you feel vitality, you feel creativity. In 2016, Michigan's cultural activities generated more than $1.3 billion in direct tourism spending by visitors. That's 12.6% of total spending for all Michigan leisure. That's pure Michigan. Michigan is within four and a half hour drive of approximately 50 million people. So if we have people coming here for the arts, it'll be an enormous boom to our economy. It's really about jobs. It's also about people that are trained and learn or take classes in the arts or exposed to it. Michigan is home to nearly 89,000 artists, arts organizations, entrepreneurs, and more than 10,000 creative businesses, hundreds of arts education programs and practitioners, and a grassroots network of community stakeholders who believe in the power of creativity to transform people and places. We are very fortunate in this community to have so many opportunities for young people to walk down the street and go into a museum and be inspired. Michigan students need access to arts and culture. Nonprofit arts and cultural organizations are at the core of a vibrant community. They offer a venue, and in some cases, the only outlet for arts education, innovation, entertainment, and cultural enrichment. The arts make the place the place. They help bring out what's authentic about a community. They help uh, define what's special about a community. And so then they attract people to want to learn about it and be part of it. Michigan is home to creative, imaginative, and powerful individuals and organizations that are applying out-of-the-box thinking, developing new ideas, leading product development, and providing a competitive edge for lifelong learning. The arts are important for a community, both from developing its cohesiveness, but a place that has a lot of arts also has fewer issues. Artists are able to help channel that creativity into ways that can lift up what's happening in the community and, and maybe offer a sense of inspiration for what else can be. Detroit loves its art, 
Detroit is very proud of its culture. You find arts and creativity everywhere in Michigan, everywhere that you go, everywhere that you are, everything that you do. We've only begun to realize the potential of the creative industries in Michigan. So much remains untapped to really understand and support the needs of those who make Michigan a more creative and dynamic place. Artists leave us with their soul, and it's the art they leave behind that keeps us whole. That's our program for today. Thanks for watching. You can go to AmericanBlackJournal.org to get more information on our guests and to check out a calendar of events. And you can always connect with us on Facebook and on Twitter. We'll see you next time. As American Black Journal looks ahead at the next 50 years, we want to hear from you, the viewers. Tell us what you think of this program and what you'd like to see on future episodes. Visit AmericanBlackJournal.org to take a quick survey and share your opinion. Thank you. Corporation is proud to manufacture innovative and environmentally friendly products for the home. Delta faucets, craft made in Marillat cabinets, and their brand paints have all been designed with you in mind. Masco and its family of companies, serving Michigan communities since 1929. How does diversity bring energy to us all? At DTE Energy, we believe that it's the contributions of all that build great communities. As a company, we grow stronger by welcoming the unique perspectives of everyone. As community members, we support our state's broad culture and heritage. From working closely with women and minority-owned suppliers to embracing our local cultures, DTE Energy is powering diversity. The DTE Energy Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public Television. For nearly 100 years, Ally has been a part of Detroit, and we give back by volunteering and donating in our community. We have a commitment to diversity and increasing economic mobility in our hometown. At Ally, we're dedicated to doing it right every single day.